Good morning, good morning. It is so great to be with y'all today. March 19th, we're right around the corner from Easter. My name is Lauren Gerlach. If I haven't had the pleasure of meeting you yet, so great to be with you. Um, I'm one of the pastors here at St. Andrew, and Scott has commissioned me with the lovely gift of teaching, teaching y'all, but he said, you just pick your topic. I mean, and were you, was anyone here last week? Yeah. Salvation? Yeah. Mm. Yeah, that was a lot, a lot going on, and so I thought we would just take a quick break and do something a little different, a little fun. Um, not that salvation isn't fun, but, uh, <laughs> oh man, Scott, if you're watching, we'll talk. Um, he, he did say, you know, Lauren, next week you could just keep it going and you could do, go even further in depth, and I thought, eh, I kind of like, like this light, happy photo, some new new teaching things. So the topic I picked for us today, I have uh, affectionately titled Phrases to Remember, and my idea was that I spend a lot of time in scripture um, with Scott, with people in the congregation, and there are these phrases that are so rich theologically, um, biblically, that we can incorporate into our vocabulary, into the way we kind of are in our everyday lives. So I thought we would talk about that, tie it to scripture, tie it to theology, Go on our way, feeling equipped with a few more new phrases to use, witnessing to our Christian faith. So with that, um, I see that we have offering baskets. I know that those are about to start going around, so that would be great. There is attendance, uh, joys and concerns. Yes. Cool. And I know that the La Hacienda Ranch, I was just having a few conversations about that. Um, What a healthy Wesleyan ministry like La Hacienda Ranch. Am I right? Just some good old dinner together, like the new version of the casserole culture. But we're going to La Hacienda Ranch, so I know that that's already sold out. I'm so glad that you guys will be in community and fellowship there. And I hear that there's more to come, so just, it's so cool. And I know you know this, but just sharing with you, it is so cool to be at a church like St. Andrew, isn't it? It is a huge gift. It is a healthy church. Yeah, clap. It it is a healthy church. It is a church that is focused on the mission of Jesus, and it is a place where y'all want to be with each other. And besides following Jesus, a very close second, remember the two commandments, love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, but then love, love your neighbor. So this is a great witness and testament to that, and just hearing it from a third party. I hope that means something to you because it, your presence is appreciated and important here. So anyways, um, with that, I have one announcement and then we'll pray. Uh, two announcements, actually. So one is that there is a brain health seminar coming up. Yes? Are we aware of this? Cool. With the second act. So Scott has a slide. I'm sure he will email it out or get it to you. Um, I don't have it here with me today, but All the details and information are on the website. It's through the second act. It is already widely popular. Um, I know that it will be very valuable. I have the privilege of working with the second act as in my pastoral role um, with adult ministries and just am constantly in awe of what this ministry is doing, but also the value it's bringing to this community. And not even just within the church walls, right? Because this, for example, the Brain Health Seminar is open to the community. Um, I know that many people, their neighbors, their friends, are signing up and going. So I hope you won't miss that. Um, I believe it's next Saturday, the 25th, so be there. Timing, information, stuff like that, all on the website. Email Scott Engel. Um, He'll love to get your emails about that. So that's one announcement. The second announcement is that we are nearing up to Holy Week, which this year has flown by. This year has truly flown by. I want to point your attention to one thing that's happening this year that's a bit different. It's an offering. So during the week of Holy Week, Monday, um, really starting Palm Sunday, through Easter is what we call Holy Week. You may be familiar with um, Maundy Thursday, Good Friday. Those are services that happen those evenings. Those have become a staple of St. Andrew. Very, very meaningful, um, beautifully done, widely attended. During the week, We are now offering something different this year that I want you to give a try. Um, It's the Stations of the Cross, which if you've never heard of that, it's 14 stations that highlight Christ's journey. And as folks who are here sitting under Scott Engel's teaching, I know that many of you are familiar with that story. It's called the Passion Narrative, but it's Jesus's 
um, play-by-play, if you will. It's really rich, and so we want to make sure to highlight and offer a way for you to engage with it, and what it will look like this year at St. Andrew is an outdoor journey, um, and it will be guided. So like you would go to a museum and sometimes have headphones to listen then to a guided um, meditation and teaching and walking through it, this too will have that. Um, Through St. Andrew, it will be the scriptures and a few teachings brief at each station, but just an opportunity to go I wrote, consider going during your lunch hour. Consider coming to a service a little early. Um, It's outdoors, so obviously weather permitting, but it's from dawn to dusk, which gives it a really cool feel because if you know the story of the Easter, that Holy Week, a lot of it is talking about the hours of the day. You know, at at 3 p.m., Jesus breathes his last. Um, At dawn, they go and they check on the tomb. At dusk, right, he's led into trial. So this is a very experiential thing. I hope you'll try it. Um, My class, The Root, we're going on Monday night. I know Kim's class is going as a group on Wednesday night. If you want to go in a group setting, I'm sure Scott can cook something up like that. If you want to go on your own, just something to take note of. We'll have maps and outlines. Um, There will be a Handicap Accessible Stations of the Cross and then a walking one um, that will take you through our beautiful campus through the creek, starting at the, sa- at the sanctuary doors, through the creek, and ending at the cross in the pond. Um, so ending at the cross as Jesus is at the cross is a pretty powerful moment. So consider doing that. But other than that, we will dive in. Would you join with me in prayer? Holy and gracious God, I praise you for every single person in this room for the call that you're putting on their lives, for their uniqueness, their gifts, their talents that are theirs specifically. You have gifted those to them. Calm our hearts, calm our minds, make us attuned to your spirit and its movement within our time together. Bring some understanding and insight that is of you to this um, in a new way for us that we may draw nearer to you. That's our motivation to draw nearer to you, God. I lift this all up in the name of the Father and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. All right, so this is an elaborate description of our topic. We're going to use our encounter with Scripture to bring truisms for daily life to the forefront. So each topic, I'll start with a Scripture. We'll kind of talk through it, unpack it, and then we'll talk about a few ways that we can move about this world with a new um, vantage point, if you will, in our Christian faith. So the first one comes to us from John 1. Very, very, very famous passage. And at each one, I've kind of highlighted, underscored, what is the priority here. So in John 1, it reads this. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without nothing, without him, nothing was made that has been made. In him was life. And that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. When you think of um, so many moments in our world, verse 5 seems awfully refreshing, doesn't it? (laughs) The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. And I would honestly love to insert, will not overcome it, is not overcoming it, right? Right? past, present, future. That's something we can trust. It's trustworthy. So this is what I have for us today. Be an acolyte. When I was graduating from Divinity School, um, like many graduation commencement ceremonies, there you know, is the pomp and circumstance, literally, and the moment of diplomas and receiving and calling of names. But right before that, do you remember, usually there's a, um, a speech, a message, a spoken truth to those who are graduating, brought forth by someone, a keynote speaker. And so at Divinity School graduation, we had that. It was a, um, a reverend doctor, so-and-so, right? They're always reverend doctors. Um, and he came to us from Washington, D.C. And when he came and spoke, the whole message was based on this one phrase. He said, be the acolyte. You are not the light, you're the acolyte. And so he unpacked that, and he said, you know, if we look at John 1 right here, 
And we're told that Jesus is the light of the world. Later in Matthew 5, we're told right here that in him was life, and the life was the light of all mankind. So if we know what the light is, if we're oriented there in that way, then what are we to do? What's our role? So has anyone here ever been an acolyte? Yeah, surely. Yes, a few. Okay. Um, and we see them. Was there an acolyte this morning? I bet there was. The acolyte has a very specific role, and the church cannot do away with it. So let me explain to you why. Anytime a church service happens, especially in the Methodist tradition and almost every denomination, there is some form of a lit flame. Have you noticed that? Yes. Okay, what does that mean? It means when we have the the lit flame, which every flicker is not like the one before, and it won't be like the one after. It, right? It's vibrant. It moves. It is the moment in which we connect to the Holy Spirit, being who is sustaining, who is with us, who is alive and with us in the church and in our worship, and reminding us and pointing us to the triune God. So we have the Father, we have the Son, and we have the Holy Spirit. When the flame enters... This is the same in, a, in the wedding I officiated last night. This is the same in a funeral ceremony. This is the same in any type of worship in this church. There will always be a lit flame because A, it reminds us that we are in worship now and we are here to worship who? God, yeah. We're here to worship God. This is not to worship ourselves. This is not for entertainment. This is not to kill time, like a good feel-good hour, you know. It's not the country club or the YMCA. It's here to worship God. And so when you have a lit flame, even just starting with that, super important. God's presence is with us. Even in divinity school, when we have, um, we have morning, noon, and evening worship at times. Those worship times, though there could be seven people or 70, there will always be a lit flame even then. Because that is something we can access and we can use to remind ourselves and center to ourselves at any given point. Who is the light of all mankind? God. And if God is the light of all mankind, and I don't know about y'all, but we see darkness like plaguing the world so often, right? We, you open a newspaper and you see a tragedy. You open things you can't explain. We have diagnoses we can't explain. Um, and we'll get to that later. The feeling of wanting to explain within our Christian faith. Oh, it's so gut-wrenching sometimes, right? But if we're oriented constantly to who the light of the world is, then first of all, we can be an acolyte in any setting. And just like that divinity graduation message, we're, we are properly oriented to God when we remember that we are not the light. Lauren, I, I will never be the light. Don't want to. <laughs> Can't. I'm not. When Christ is in, when I live in a way that Christ is in me, when the Holy Spirit is in me, and you live in that way where the Holy Spirit is in you, we bear the light, we bear witness constantly in our words, in our actions, in our thoughts, in our encounters, in our hugs, in our handshakes, in our smiles, right? There's so many ways that we're embodying this. But it also means this, and this is the first phrase to remember. What is true in the light is also true in the darkness, just because it's dark doesn't mean it's not, doesn't mean truth isn't truth. And so in the gospel narratives, there's more than one time where Jesus is talking about his names. And if you were here the last seven weeks-ish before this series, we talked a lot about those names. One of the weeks, we focused in worship about Jesus, who says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. We've talked about the light of life. Now here we are talking about truth. What's true in the light When we sit down, Scott and I feel like we're always talking about this. When we're sitting down to identify the essentials, the things that can't change, that shouldn't change, um, by definition, they are true. (laughs) Whether they are in the shade or in the sun doesn't change the fact that they're true. Do you see? In my class this morning, we were talking, we're in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 8 and 9. And there was one point in which Jesus tells his disciples, he says, I'm sending you out. He sends out the 12 disciples. He sends them out to the towns, and he says, if you get to a town and you're unwelcomed, here's what to do. Which is kind of a funny thing that he would even prepare them for what that might be like. He says, when you get there, 
I want you to stay in the same home as everyone else and stay there. Don't hop around. Don't check in and out to different hotels, right? Stay with your host. I want you to bear witness. And if they still don't accept you, essentially, then you can leave. And when you leave, continue to bear witness. The point is, why would Jesus prepare them for that? Like, why wouldn't Jesus say, you know, best of luck, (laughs) text me how it goes, drop me a pin of your location when you're done with that, right? No, because Jesus knows. In John chapter 15, it says what? It says, oh man, gear up for expecting, for sometimes the world will not accept you. That's what he tells to his disciples, his closest friends. And you can imagine they might say, why? And Jesus will say, well, let me tell you. Because when I came, they didn't expect me. They didn't welcome me. They persecuted me. You can expect similar things. And what does that do that links us to Jesus? If we're going to participate in the mission, we better be linked, right? (laughs) We better be arm in arm. So just a heads up, that's how I feel like Jesus is telling him, hey, heads up, you might be met with this, this reaction. You might be met with this reality that not everyone can get it right now and right then but even if it looks dark and this was my point to my class this morning even if that happens do i go back to the drawing board at lauren's desk and i say well that didn't work i should just drop a new faith i should just drop a new way a new person to follow a new way to follow if i'm going to follow jesus no because that's not the truth If we present it and it's not accepted, it's not welcome. And I said, you know, there's plenty of humanity in that, right? I could probably do a few things better. They could probably do a few things better. But God is with us in that. And when it's true, we don't deny, oh, all of a sudden it needs to be changed. It needs to be rewritten. We need to come up with a new religion all of a sudden, a new faith. That's not what Jesus says. He doesn't say go home and, you know, craft up something that the world likes better, right? They don't like Rocky Road ice cream? Offer them butter pecan. He doesn't say that. We're still offering, Rocky Road's my favorite, Rocky Road ice cream. (laughs) Right? It is what it is. And that's a beautiful part. That is why the Christian faith grew in those early centuries. Because it was unwavering. It was certain. And they had plenty of growing room to do, just like you and I. I'm not saying that we are perfect. I'm not saying this faith has come to a perfect spot of me embodying it and you embodying it. But if we're faithful to the task and to the truth of this faith, that is the call. So what's true in in the light is also true in the darkness. That would be written on the fridge, my refrigerator, with my husband and I in our home. The next one, chapter 8 in the Gospel of John. This is a tale into it. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. He goes one step further to say, a city on a hill cannot be hid. A light cannot be put under a a bushel. Light is light. And you know what light does by definition? It shines. Think about that. That is the definition. That is an attribute of it, part of it, to illuminate, to show, to expose, to shine. So, That's my speech about light. The next one. The next one. I liked this photo because I feel like, y'all, I have been on a soapbox recently. (laughs) Like, I think I learned that from Scott, right? We all have our soapboxes. Um, My soapbox is right now about what it means in the faith to defend and preserve. It's like a a two-step dance. We can defend and preserve, and they're both good, and they keep the faith going. This one also says protect. That's fine. Sounds good. But defend and preserve. And I find this so often in scripture. So when we're walking through things like the Gospel of Luke, when we're walking through the sermon series, um, we're about to come up to one on Peter right now, right after Easter. I look at what scripture says, and I think about the fact that I'm reading it today, and I think about the fact that my great, 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 great grandkids could read it then. And I think about how small I am. And then I feel relieved. 
<laughs> and then I feel very relieved. Because what will last so much longer than Twitter feeds, even the Wall Street Journal, even you know, TV programming, what will last and what has lasted, obviously, is this. Okay, so if that's the case, are we going to just stand by in any time, any place, that this is in um, threat, if you will? What are we going to do then? And it's hard to think about that because I feel like often in my life, that's not, I'm not going places where people aren't welcoming Christians. I'm not, um, I spend a lot of time with Christians, you can imagine. Um, and so it doesn't feel that relevant at times. But then when I read how Jesus talks to his disciples, I'm reminded of the reality that is much larger than myself. I like to say it like this. If you want to imagine how Jesus is in his attributes and his nature and his conversations look how he talks to his disciples okay take a fine tooth comb to this and look how he talks to them in dialogue or sometimes monologue like any good teacher right <laughs> yes <laughs> yes that was a pun um <laughs> whether jesus is going back and forth with them or teaching them or praying for them, or even retreating from them up on a mountain or away in a boat to have time of prayer alone, then he comes back, right? When he's in that ebb and flow of that dialogue, look how he talks to them. I was reminded of there's a moment in the Bible that confuses all of us, myself included at times, called the transfiguration. And it is a moment in which Jesus takes Peter, James, and John, some of his BFFs, okay, best friends forever, actually BFF, best friend for life, literally, he takes them up onto the mountain and he's transfigured in glory. And transfigured doesn't mean to be changed into something else. Transfigured means to be revealed in more of the nature you already are. And it says that he becomes dazzling white. And so any of you who use bleach white, right? Like if you can imagine that white times a thousand, just glowing, shimmering, in full glory, Jesus is there. And what do his best friends forever do? They totally freak out, just like I would. And they fall to the ground, hit the deck. They're like so disoriented. They see two dead guys because all of a sudden they see Elijah and Moses. And I'm sure they're wondering what that's about. It's just this very bizarre scene. But the thing about it is, is that what does Jesus, how does he treat his disciples in a moment like that? I'll tell you, the end of the story is that he reaches down and it says he touches them gently. And he says, don't be afraid, get up. As if to say, You're with, I'm still Jesus, I'm still me, you're still you, I'm right here. But he touches them, just, I can just imagine, like on the shoulder. And what I like to remind us is that Jesus is both powerful and gentle. Powerful and gentle, not just one or the other, but the perfect combination so that in that moment that's so startling and freaky and weird, probably, and yet is Jesus in full glory that I would give anything to see. And they're on the ground and they look up and you can just imagine like, that, like what it would be felt like to just have a tap on the shoulder and just to say, it, you know, I'm me. It's okay. Still here. I'm with you. We're doing this together. Like, I've brought you up on the mountain to see me in full glory as a gift. I've gifted that to you. And so when you know stories like that, and you hear stories like that, that come from this anthology, this collection of books, that's what the Bible is. Not one book, many books. And when you're familiar with them, you don't really want them to be threatened, do you? Because they're about who? They're about God. And the funny part is, it's not that God will get scared and God can't handle threat. And <laughs> God is God. But that's what happens when you love. When you love, you care deeply and you want to protect, preserve, and defend. When I look at my family, I look at people important to me, I want to defend, protect, and preserve them. Our relationship 
the way I care for them, the way they care for me, the activities we do together, the expressions that we live throughout and interact with God in our faith. I want to protect and, pr- and defend and preserve all of those things because they're good and because I love them. And at one point in First Peter, there's this phrase that gets kind of tossed around all over the place, and I think it's important for us to break it down together because it says this, But in your hearts revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give a defense to anyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. Um, There's three things here. Be prepared, a defense, and most importantly, those two are nice, those two are there, but most importantly, for the hope. So we have to be clear about the hope before we can start any of the others, right? Right, what's the thing? What's the hope? I can, I could read this forwards and backwards, page to page, cover to cover. But if I'm not clear about the hope, me walking around Trader Joe's running into someone, them asking me about my faith, which has never once happened, but I am ready. (laughs) Gosh darn it, I will be ready. (sighs) Should that happen and find you in a circumstance like that, wouldn't it be nice? Man, wouldn't it be nice? I was serving in the storehouse 10 years ago, probably, one Saturday, way, way before I ever had a dream of, I mean, ever could have even imagined I would be a pastor or in the church, on staff, in any way. I was still working in corporate, and I was just coming here on Sundays, serving, going home, um, and I fell in love with doing it. I loved meeting the neighbors. It was back before the construction, if you can picture it right, the old youth wing area-ish. And one Sunday, I met this couple, this husband and wife, and I still can remember their last name. Complete strangers. I've never talked to them since. I've exchanged emails with them once, um, way back then, because they essentially came through the line, and while I was in the dry goods thing where I was helping them select their preferences, they asked me to do this. They just straight up were like, could you just why do you do this, and like, why the church, and what does the church believe in, like, who is Jesus? All in the dry goods section. <laughs> seriously, seriously, in the personal shopper section, that's what it was called. Okay, and so, and I, there I am, I'm attending on Sundays, I was an usher, I, I knew, I could tell them, you know, on the left side, the way the pew worked, I couldn't, I mean, what was I going to say in that amount of time? Was I equipped? Did I know what to say? Sure didn't, but I started talking, and I had this feeling of like, okay, God, how insane and how cool is this moment? I have never been in a moment where anyone has asked me to give an account on my faith just like that, and in a setting where I was not expecting it, clearly. And had I been very clear on the hope, which I think I got kind of close because then they came back, Um, but had I been clearer, Gosh, how good that could have been. Had I been willing and able to kind of like touch on the points of, I do it because of this. Jesus is in my life because of this. Or here's what the church even is. So cool. Because you know what I realized is that we feed um, an amazing amount of people physically with the storehouse. And I know many of you know this, but we feed an amazing amount of people spiritually at the storehouse, at this church, in our communities here at St. Andrew. We are hungry people. There's no way around it. And there's so many parts in Scripture where you look at someone, and I I read in the woman who is reaching for Jesus' cloak. Remember that story? The fringe of his cloak. She's been bleeding for 12 years, and she just wants it to stop. It's isolating. She's in pain. It's, she has lonely, I'm sure, outcast, and she's desperate. And so, yeah, she gets on the floor and then reaches over across his feet because that fringe of the cloak would be at the bottom of a cloak, okay? So that's like three inches from the ground. In the crowds, chaotic, noisy, sweaty, her desperation is so like us sometimes, isn't it? It may not look like that, and we may not even have our hearts attuned sometimes to how desperate we are for Jesus. 
But sometimes, I, I know I do, I need to check myself. Okay, Lauren, what, is the, what do I need? What do I need to know in order to be more faithful to Christ? What do I need to know in order to be clear on the hope I have in Christ? And then, when I am in the Trader Joe's frozen section, getting the tilapias that are so good there, this is not sponsored by Trader Joe's, but they're so good, when I am there, gosh, how good could that be? Gosh, what could God do with that? What could he do with you? What will he do? He will. That's the thing. That's the amazing part about scripture. I misspoke. I said could. Scripture is about what will he do. Because God will and is using us. So, we continue. Like the Apostle Paul. Just as aggressively as he defended the faith, did he also, just as aggressively as he persecuted the faith, excuse me, did he also defend it? That's kind of crazy to think about. Here we have the Apostle Paul who denounced the faith, was persecuting Christians, hunting them down um, in every which way, basically, until his conversion on the road to Damascus when he meets Christ. And he says, Saul, Saul, I mean, talk about a direct statement from Jesus, right? Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It's like, that's some tough love. Okay, that's very, very direct. And then what? Jesus and God and the Spirit, the triune God, uses Saul in a way that he never would. Marked by the change of his name, he turns into Paul, and he is what? One of the most prominent apostles, founders, advancers of the Christian faith. And then, of course, because I couldn't leave y'all without some good patristics, nerdy information. Um, the patristics are the early church fathers from the first to the fourth century. One of them is named Ignatius of Antioch. And I found this so interesting, this quote. He said, it's not that I merely want to be called a Christian, but I want to actually be one. In the year 107, Ignatius delineates between being called a Christian and being one. Like, isn't that so interesting? In the, ter- in, I mean, a time and a place where being Christian is already new. They're used to be Jewish. Now they follow Jesus. The Christian faith begins, right? Like this is already a game-changing thing. And he's delineating, I don't even just want to be called that. That shares so much of the heart that we have, I think, sometimes, even about ourselves. I mean, think in your own life when someone has, someone may know your name, and you know, they know my name, but they don't really know me yet. And you think, oh, I wish they knew me. Oh, I wish I knew them. I know their name, but I don't really, I haven't gotten to get to know them yet. Being nominal, familiar nominally with someone, or being known nominally as a Christian, for Ignatius in the year 107 is different, he thinks, than actually being one. And he says, yes, if I prove to be one, then I can have the name. It gets a little complicated. Come fire, cross, battling with wild beasts, wrenching of bones, mangling of limbs, crushing my whole body, cruel tortures of the devil, only let me get to Jesus. All of that to say, I mean, this dude Ignatius was writing in a time of extreme persecution, so we should not be surprised that he includes that laundry list of, of ways of being persecuted. Aside from those ways, look at the bottom part, only just let me get to Jesus. Like he starts with a deep desire to be drawing nearer to God, to be closer and closer and closer to following Christ so that people may see that in him. Not see the name on the name tag. Like when Scott Engel, we, he and I talk, and I know he talks with you a lot about that name tag called Faith in Christ that N.T. Wright talks about. That's what it means to be a Christian. This morning we were just talking about faith is something you can't see. I mean, I don't open my wallet and show you my driver's license and this card and that card and then my faith card and then this. That's not how faith works. It's not, it's not visible like that. And so here, to be a Christian, let me give you a visual. Ignatius there in the center. That's what they talk about then, but if we're here to defend and preserve, 
then we kind of pull it into the now, the here. That is the long task of the Christian faith. It is taking this book, I feel like I'm saying this all the time, from way back then, over there, from those people, to here, to now, for you and I. And the reason we can make such a bold claim and connect to the two is because we locate ourselves in this story. That's a really big part that we talk a lot about that in more of like the academy setting is like how do we locate ourselves and in what story? Well, as Christians, it's very clear and kind of easy. It could be harder. Let me say that. <laughs> it could be harder. That is why, like when you go to something like Stations of the Cross or when you go to Good Friday or definitely when you come on Easter Sunday, praise God that we are located within that story. And let me tell you how. Because at the moment of Maundy Thursday, he lifts up the loaf of bread like he has done before, like Jesus did at the feeding of the 5,000, like he did at Passover every year at that time. But he lifts up the bread and he breaks it and he gives thanks. And just like at the feeding of the 5,000, when it's multiplied exponentially without any explanation except faith, except miracles, except the way God is, just like that on that Thursday night, on Maundy Thursday, he lifts up the bread and he takes his friends together. And for the first time, instead of them all sitting around and usually talking about the broken bones of the lamb or the bloodshed from the lamb, he says, I, the word I, personal pronouns, in place of the lamb. My body, my blood, I give. Not I take, I give. And you and I are located in that story because what? We are just like the disciples, reclining at the table, receiving. Every first Sunday here, every time you've ever been to Eucharist, we are recipients of something we never deserved, and praise God, we can receive. And then Friday, we're located there because just as Jesus does something for the purpose of our sake and from love, we are absolutely located in that. Again, the recipients of something unmerited, undeserved, miraculous gesture of love. And then on Easter Sunday, the resurrection, in which it says what? He is the first son of Adam, the firstborn resurrected of the dead, from which Paul says there will be many, many, right? If you've heard Scott go on and on about resurrection, that's for good reason, because you and I share in that. We locate ourselves within this story. In Revelation 21, the new heavens and the new earth, I and you are located in that story. I fully expect to be located in that story. St. Andrew is located in that story. That's why it's so gosh darn awesome that we're focused on mission. The mission of Jesus is the only thing that lasts. The mission of Jesus is the light that shines in the darkness, and the darkness will not overcome it. And so for those of you who are, you know, investors, right, what's worth investing in? The light that shines in the darkness, then the darkness will not overcome it? Sounds pretty good to me. The next one is courage. Courage, um, man, we have a lot of modern quotes about courage, but I want to show you where it comes from scripture. Deuteronomy 31. This is a moment in which I'm a big Deuteronomy fan. I know y'all know that, but can't help myself. Gospel of John, Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy in this moment is a time in which Moses is handing off his ministry, if you will, his journey, his task of bringing the Israelites to the promised land and he gets right up, he bumps right up against the border, if you will, okay? And so it is said to Moses, he will not enter the promised land. He's actually about to die, and he's giving a speech in this exact pericope. That means a section of scripture. In this section of scripture, he is giving his speech to the people, and he's including Joshua, because Joshua will be the one who then takes them into the promised land. 
And like any great leader, he starts with something we want to hear. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Don't be afraid or terrified because of them. For the Lord your God goes with you. He will never leave you, never forsake you. Then Moses summoned Joshua and said to him in the presence of all Israel, isn't this funny? Be strong and courageous. Moses repeats exactly what God tells him. Very obedient. For you must go with this people into this land that the Lord swore to their ancestors to give to them. You must divide it among them as their inheritance. The Lord himself goes before you and will be with you, and he will never leave you nor forsake you. Do not be afraid. And then I underlined this. Do not be discouraged. I think we totally lose, totally lose the definition of discouraged sometime in our everyday vernacular. Don't be discouraged. Don't be short of real courage. Don't be lacking in courage. What if we said it that way? Usually when I hear discouraged, you know, don't be discouraged. Okay, don't feel bad, right? Be, str- you know, be strong. Don't feel bad. But what if I said, don't be short of courage? And what if we thought of courage like Stanley Hauerwas? He's a professor at Duke Divinity School. What if we thought about it and approached it like this? Many people say this. Courage is not the absence of fear. Yes. But it is the formation of rightly knowing what should or should not be feared. So I want to offer this to you. The next time, because this, this whole lesson is about equipping us to have things in our minds to hold on to, handholds, if you will, of the Christian faith, so that we're, when we're living our practical everyday lives, we can go back to this. So what if there is something that you are afraid of? Yep, that, that's me. I, there are things that I'm afraid of. And when I think of those things... In the lens of this, I put my glasses on, my Stanley Hauerwas glasses for courage, and I think, okay, Lauren, courage is not the absence of fear. Got it. Okay. Why am I fearing this, and is it worth it? Is it worth fearing? And you know what I balance that up against to look at? This. Because there are a lot of things in our lives, there are a lot of... um, people and content and news and et cetera that create fear in us. And we're human, so we respond to that. We feel it. We notice it, right? Like we call it the pit in our stomach sometimes. Like, oh, man. When I consult this or when I consult God or I'm reminded by someone else who is doing it and I think, oh, wow, why didn't I do that? (laughs) Right? Why didn't I check in with God and say, is this worth being afraid of? And it's okay if the answer is yes. Oftentimes, I feel very, very justified in, in my fears. I'm like, yep, that sure is. Checks out. That passes the test, right? Still seems like something I should be afraid of. Okay, then if that's the case, I can go to places in here, in this text, and say, okay, well, what does God say when we're afraid? If you have never checked out the Psalms, I highly encourage you to, because it's, writ- it's a bunch of songs written for scared people, okay? So when you check yourself with Stanley Hauerwas and you say, yep, sure I am, still, still afraid, that, that is still worth fearing, then I want you to go to the Psalms. Pop open the book of Psalms and take a ride through there and look around and see what it says. See what God tells scared people like me and like you. And then Better case scenario, if you look at this like I did the other day and I think, mm, yeah, I'm, a, I'm afraid of that. And then I hold it in light of what Stanley Haras has offered and I say, oh, that's not worth being afraid of. It, remember I said we're in the long game here. In the long game, in the long task of being a Christian and of being faithful and growing in faith, that thing I was afraid of all of a sudden just grew empty. Because that can happen, right? When we operate in the way of the world instead of God's economy, that can happen. And it's a good thing, because that, again, is one more way that we're locating ourselves in Scripture. The next one goes into Galatians 1.10. This is also a great, great verse to put on a sticky note on your desk or in your room or on your dashboard if you ever ever think twice about this. This is the Apostle Paul. He's writing 
to the Galatians, and he says, well, so, this is in the intro, too. I mean, talk about a way to start a letter. Am I now trying to win the approval of human beings or of God? Even just pause there. Win, approval, trying. Those are very, like, strained words, aren't they? (laughs) Those take a lot of energy to try, to win, and then approval is just exhausting. So am I trying to win the approval of human beings or of God? And he says it again. This is exactly how the verse is written. Or am I trying to please people? If I were still trying to be, please people, I wouldn't be a servant of Christ. Once I called Scott Engel like a few months ago, and I asked him a question I know I asked a few years ago, but I just wanted to hear him say it again. You ever have people in your life like that? You're like, yeah, we know the answer, but I just want to hear you say it. It's reassuring. Let me say that. I called Scott and I said, uh, do you think this Christian faith is kind of like an all or nothing thing? And um, what I meant was, do you think like if we're not for God, we're against God? And in Scott's deep voice, he said, yes. (laughs) And I said, oh, okay. (laughs) Can we talk about that? Can we talk about that? Like, isn't that kind of hard to hear sometimes? All, nothing, for God, against God. And we could be here all day, and I could just, we could just walk through the scriptures, and Scott would call in because he wouldn't want to miss the party, and it would be great. But, but, this in Galatians is so like that. Jesus brings it to the Gospels when he says, you cannot serve two masters, Right? Here, you cannot serve two different things, one of them always being God. So if you're going to serve someone, something, someplace, insert here thing, other than God, it's not going to work. you got to pick one. And in here, Galatians reminded me of this, right? Like this culture of like people pleasing and doing it all and better, faster, stronger, hustle, you know? And, and I look like that a lot of the times, I think. So I'm not, I'm not throwing shade anywhere. I, that's, I constantly feel like I have plates spinning and so many things going. And then, oh yeah, you ever have this feeling? Oh yeah, where's God? Okay, yeah. And then there's faith, you know? Like everything else is calendared except God. <laughs> I have outlook meetings for everything else except God. So we have to make room and spread out the bumpers and the boundaries so that the priority and the only one we're serving is God. Put another way, I I really appreciate the message in their work in doing translations for the scriptures because I think it says it in a new standpoint. He says this, do you think I speak this strongly in order to manipulate crowds or court favor with God or get popular applause? Key word on popular. Popular only works if there is a crowd for there to be a populace on, for there to be a majority within. Think about that. When you serve God, can you be popular? No. Can you be yourself? Yes, that's it. That's the beauty. Because popularity requires the masses. It requires many people, many opinions, many thoughts. To be popular with God is a non-point. There's no point. There is to be Lauren with God or you with God. You know, it's a relationship. So here's here's the takeaway. And I know you've heard this. This is not original to me. If we live for other people's praise, we'll die by their criticism. Keyword, people. People's praise, people's criticism. Better put, if you live for God, then what? Joy. Then what? Abundance. Then what? Presence. Then what? Stability. Then what? Loyalty. Then what? Faithfulness. Do you like those words better than what's on the screen? I like them a lot better. This is coming to us from John 15 which we had touched on earlier. If the world hates you, keep in mind it hated me first. Good news coming in verse 19. If you belong to the world, it would love you as its own. 
as it is. Doesn't that just sound like a smart sentence? As it is, you don't. <laughs> as it is, you don't. You don't belong. We don't belong to the world. To belong to someone, it has to be a someone, and the world is not a someone. The world is created by God. We belong to God. Praise God. So the last one here is truth. And th this is really, really important. Um, we are told in many different ways in the scriptures about the spirit of truth, about Jesus as the truth. I want to skip ahead to this. If you ever wonder what that confusing, long, weird word called theology is, one way to understand it is this. The task of theology, yes, it means study of God, literally, but the task of it is to tell the truth about God. That's how I consider my call. When I show up here any day of the week, any minute of the day, with any one of you or by myself, my job is to tell the truth about God. And there are so many times I wish I had a more comprehensive outline <laughs> and more information to just continuing to know God more and more. That is the aspiration of this life that we're given, to know God more and more and more and to desire God. Because you have already figured it out right now, Lauren is a human, which means that I'm limited. And you are a human, which means you're limited. But insofar as we are able and insofar as it is good for the posture of our hearts, our job is to show up and learn a little bit more so that we can tell the truth a little bit more about God. And then the second part, theological anthropology. I think that's self-explanatory, anthropology in relation to theology. Our humanness in relation to God. The second job is to tell the truth about ourselves, which is what we started to do a little bit today, right? We are located in this story. You don't have to know every answer. You don't have to pass every quiz question. You don't have to talk at Trader Joe's about it. Get in your tilapia, I promise. But if you're presented the opportunity, wouldn't it be nice to think of every day a little bit like that? I'm here to tell the truth about God insofar as I'm able, which means I want to know a little bit more. I want to love him a little bit more. I want to be modeled after him a little bit more. And then the second, to tell the truth about myself. I'm a child of God. The Holy Spirit is within me. The Holy Spirit is what susta who sustains me. Christ is my Lord. Like, you, that's just a few. And if those sound too cheesy, how about this? I don't fully understand how, but I know I'm made in the image of God. How's that? True. True. About every single person here. Every heartbeat going. True. Made in God's image. So we can start there. We can tell the truth about God and tell the truth about ourselves. With that, I think we'll take the prayers. And I will close this in prayer. So would you join me? Holy and gracious God, we want so badly to tell the truth about you. Help us. Clarify it for us. Draw us near. Love us relentlessly because we are not perfect. We don't get it right. But we know, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see the face of God. We know, working a little bit more every day to give a defense for the hope we have in Christ, being a little bit clear about telling the truth about ourselves, about only serving one person, that's you, Lord. All of these things, all of these truisms, Remind us the ultimate reality that you are the light of life and the light shines in the darkness and the darkness will not, has not overcome it. And we praise you for that, Jesus. I ask you to be with us until we reunite next Sunday safely, healthy, and in love and um, Christian fellowship for one another at this wonderful place we call St. Andrew. All this I pray in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you. Alrighty, we'll quickly go through joys and concerns. We have a prayer for Paul Williams, husband of Jody Williams, getting a heart stint tomorrow. A prayer for a friend's husband, Rick, who's in the hospital with a serious blood disorder, disease. 
Prayers for Mike Morton on his recovery from surgery. Prayers for Melanie Kwan, who has been diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. Prayers for her family as well, as they all struggled with determining the best treatment plan. Prayers for a nephew, Adam, as he recovers from bypass surgery. Wow, he's had multiple serious medical problems. Prayers for health and healing for Deanna Sims. Prayers for comfort for Kathy Sutherland's dear friend, Laura Sturzing, as she deals with depression and pain from pa pancreatic cancer. Wow. Continued prayers for Jan Brooks, recovering from hip, hip replacement surgery. Continued prayer for everyone in East Palestine, Ohio. Continued prayers for the people of Ukraine. Continued prayers for the people of Turkey. Over 47,000 died in the recent earthquake. Continued prayers for the people in Syria, affected by the recent earthquake. Prayers for the people in Peru, affected by the earthquake, over 100 killed. For Mike and Beth Kelly, happy birthday to their daughter, Colleen, on Monday. Prayers for people dealing with serious illness, and there, it feels like there's more than usual. And prayers for our daughter got a job transfer, someone's daughter who will moved to San Diego this week, grateful for the transfer and good people to help her live with. Prayers for a friend who is having a heart procedure this week. Also prayers for another friend who is recovering from a brother's something. Prayers for their brother. Prayer for healing and recovery for Mike Morton also. All right, we lift all these up and say, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Go in peace. Have a great week.